Young and without much direction in life, my parents pushed me to join the Army. They couldn't afford higher education for me and my younger sister, and this was the only way they could make sure that we had higher education. My mother was a U.S. Army sergeant. She was stationed at San Diego State University as part of the ROTC program before finally retiring. After dealing with a multitude of students, she'd come to learn of a field in the military that gave back, a degree. And this is a degree that transferred into the civilian world when most did not. So I found myself in a room along with dozens of others, silently sobbing with my right hand raised as I was sworn in the star-spangled flag was hanging against the wall in the front. After being stationed at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, right in the heart of Washington, D.C., one thing was for sure. I was going to do the rest of my two years and then go back home to San Diego, where the sun always shone and the cold did not exist. <laughs> From what I've been told, I had a primo duty station at Walter Reed. My mom was stationed in Korea when I was a kid, and it seemed like she was gone forever. I wanted to know that I can always just come back home. She couldn't. So I became a nurse, working at a medical surgical unit, Ward 68, that dealt with anything from the ears, note, and throat cases to the gut. Every so often I would get lucky, and I would have a young soldier. He would need to come in and stay overnight for an appendectomy, which was actually refreshing. We could talk about movies that were filmed in color, uh, music from this decade, the average age of my usual patients was 60 and above. On September 11th, all that changed. I walked into an elderly man's room with his Metamucil in tow. His television was on, and his mouth agape. The towers fell. We went to war. Not too much longer after that, our troops started to come home. But not in that fashion that the recruiters like to showcase, no. There was no surprise visits from GI mommy or daddy showing up in junior's classroom, no hunky marines showing up early and unannounced at their spouse's jobs, no. Tattered, scathed, broken, both mentally and physically, that's what we saw. The unit I worked on transformed. The average age of my patients dropped to the early 20s. There were nights where two nurses from each unit in the hospital would make their way downstairs to a makeshift triage area. There were some who were able to get off the bus under their own will. The rest were in litters, waiting to be carried out and placed onto gur gurneys. Their buddy bloodied bandages last changed long ago. We'd make sure they were stable and then figure out where to put them based on injury type and level of care needed. Other nights, a medevac would arrive on the helipad atop the helicopter, or the, on top of the hospital roof. That usually spelled a serious situation. I met one of those helicopters once. The patient died in the process of getting to the States, twice. They needed him to have a new military ID since he was patrolling without one at the time of injury. His dog tags just weren't enough. So they took his picture in flight. When it was snapped, he was soulless. The very fact that he ended up living is beyond me. The hospital's old rooms, once used for storage, were converted back into rooms that could bear patients. Soldiers were greeted with smiles and stifled tears. Welcome to Walter Reed. After some time, it became a well-oiled machine. Telephone cards, cash aid on debit cards, and family would arrive soon thereafter. The Red Cross was pretty amazing. There was joy and pain all at once. I've seen so many reunions. A father met his twin girls, only a few months old for the very first time there. A 19-year-old hugged his parents who were just happy to have their baby back. One young lady was able to reconnect to her surprise with her bomb dog. Considering her own injuries and luck just to be alive after an explosive went off, she could only imagine he had not survived. He jumped onto her bed and she wept for joy, lips trembling, Tears streaming. I was happy for myself too, finally getting to see the tears of relief. Too often I watch soldiers and significant others become just as distant as a returning counterpart. I've changed IVs while I watch newly reunited couples fidget, reluctant to hold a stump where a hand once wore a wedding band. Slow to talk about the future. They said it with their eyes. 
how do I live with this? Be it a lost limb, a disfigured face, and a fixed bag to an abdomen that will forever, forever collect stool, the couple shared that look. The adjustment is the worst. We did our duty, we fixed their body, but we neglected <coughs> their minds. I was shocked by the amount of patients who wanted to go back to war. They weren't done yet. Their brothers were still over there and they needed to go back. There were others who resented their time spent. We trained those motherfuckers, one of my patients exclaimed. And now here we are getting shot up with our own shit too. It was years of this, days and nights that left me drained and exhausted from not knowing how to deal with their baggage coupled with my own emotions, but how in the world could I complain? How could I? So I stuck to the script, I stuffed it down. But my favorite perk at Walter Reed had to be the huge celebrity turnout to support the troops. It was VIP central for quite some time. Men and women in uniform got a kick out of it too for the most part. I've hugged Stevie Nicks. I shook the hand of Mick Foley. I almost spilled pee on Justin Timberlake. <laughs> John Voigt had his own camera guy, and he took photos with each soldier room by room. And Tyra Banks and her long leg crew were pretty popular with the guys too. It was really good to see uplifted spirits, even if it was just temporary. So it was almost standard for all the soldiers admitted to the hospital to be on an antidepressant and some sort of mood stabilizer, bolster that with a sleeping aid done in cookie cutter fashion. Everyone got the same thing. Granted, some changes were made if it didn't seem to help. There were brief meetings with the psych doctor. The ones who displayed serious symptoms or who reached out were seen more. But I don't remember many follow-ups, not for the masses. Some soldiers came to Walter Reed and never left. Their only escape would be the eventual day pass, but they would soon return for pain and sleeping pills when their short supply would run out. A few even got a three-day pass, I naturally assume that if you can leave the hospital and you don't have to return for three days, well, you don't need to stay in the hospital anymore. But then I wondered if they even wanted to leave. They were used to the structure, the order. They were used to those walls. Maybe there was nothing left for them without the military. They were screaming for help, but all we gave them were pills. The intake rate slowed down eventually, a couple years into the war, but still, they just kept coming, and the cycle remained the same. I feel guilty sometimes that I was stateside. I got off easy. I wasn't on the front lines. There was this older soldier I had taken care of. He was a platoon sergeant, a squad leader. He had valor. I dressed his wounds, and he would give me life advice. And he listened as I told him how I felt one night. And when I was finished, he told me that I was on the front lines that his soldiers needed me here to take care of them when they came back. And he'll never know how badly I needed his permission to believe it myself. Thank you. Kelly Hewlett. <laughs>